you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, we are looking at the seventh trumpet, the seventh trumpet. And if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, uh, the outline, let me give it to you as we start. Number one, praise for God's power. Folks, He is powerful. Number two, praise for God's judgment. Folks, everybody better get ready, folks. He will judge all of mankind. And number three, praise God for God's covenant. For God's covenant. The seventh trumpet. You know, the sounding of the seventh trumpet will set in motion the final events leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. It will also introduce Jesus' earthly millennial kingdom. The seven bold judgments are included within the seventh trumpet. The final fury of the day of the Lord will come. The final harvest of judgment on the earth will take place. And Jesus will defeat the kings of the earth at the battle of Armageddon. The seventh trumpet also will be a coronation of Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's look at this exciting scripture in the last half of Revelation 11. And by the way, the sounding of the a seventh trumpet signals God's answer to the Lord's prayer found in Matthew 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah, folks. Another promise of God will be fulfilled. So let's look at the seventh trumpet. Revelation, Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven. And we see loud announcements. We've seen that all through the book of Revelation. And it, this is an important announcement saying, the kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And you have to realize, folks, that the kingdom of this world is Satan, okay? And I just jotted down a few names of Satan that are found in the Word of God. Uh, the devil, the accuser, the adversary, the dragon, the evil one, the god of this world, a roaring lion, the ruler of demons, the serpent, the tempter, and the prince and the power of the air. Even during this first part uh, of uh, Revelations, we have seen that the Antichrist is going to come into power, and he will be energized by Satan. He will be energized by the demons and all these things. When, when he makes a pact with Israel, everything seems to be doing well. But we have told you halfway through, everything's going to change. And I am telling you, uh, you know, throughout the book of Revelation, we have seen Christian martyrs. And folks, I am telling you, Satan hates Christians. Satan hates any New Testament church. Satan hates when the baptismal waters move. But in this scripture, I'm telling you, everything is going to change. Because he is king of kings and Lord of lords. And look what it says. And it says, and he shall reign forever and ever. It seems like today Satan is winning the battle. But folks, he has lost the war. We win. There is victory in Jesus. And there is coming a day when everything will change. Everything. And even prophetically, if you look in Psalm chapter 2, go with me to Psalm 2. We always dive into the, the, the prophetic scriptures which tie the New Testament and the Old Testament. Psalm 2, it's entitled the Messiah's Triumph and Kingdom. Why do the nations rage? And if you notice that, the lost people are getting more bold and more bold. They hate God more and more. They use God's word and name in vain. They persecute the Christians and those who love God. 
Why? Because they are not saved. They do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it's all about them. It's all about them. And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Oh, folks, that European nations, they will come together, those lost kings, those people that think they're in control while they're here on earth, will be destroyed according to God's holy word. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision, and he shall speak to, to them his wrath and, the distra- and distress them in his deep pleasure. See, we are still living in the time of grace. God's invitation is still open. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you will come forward, if you will pronounce him as king of your life, if you will make a profession of faith, you can be saved. But I am telling you, there are many, many people that reject the Word of God and reject the Spirit of God. Verse 6, yet I have set my king on my holy Zion. And we are talking about Jesus. And we'll declare the decree. And the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And it really, he's saying, when it's all said and done, folks, Jesus will destroy the enemy. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. When His wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in Him. Oh folks, the greatest decision that you could ever make in your life is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And He is going to win. Matter of fact, Philippians chapter 2, let me give you another verse. Philippians 2, if you would, go with me. Philippians 2, verse 9. Therefore God shall highly exalt him, talking about Jesus, and give him a name which is above every name. I don't know about you, but I love the name Jesus. I love to think it. I love to meditate on it. I love to sing it. I love to say it. Folks, Jesus is everything to a Christian. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. It's going to go one of two ways, folks. You will bow to Him as your Lord and Savior, or you will bow to Him not knowing Him and be punished and, and be sent to hell because you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and of the heaven and on the earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. All this announcements of the seventh trumpet. And again, we, we, we come out of another interlude. We've had two already, and there's the third one. But here, it is gonna, it's, it's going to just finish up and And again, there's a lot of revelation left. But I am telling you, those bold judgments and those plagues will be the worst known to mankind. And we will talk about them soon. Now look at the rest of that verse. And the 24 elders, verse 16, who sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God. We know, as I said earlier, the 24 elders uh, is possibly the the 12 tribes of Israel, the representation of the Old Testament, and the 12 disciples, and these are all of the redeemed. These are all those who know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And and folks, I've been to some good singings. 
I've been to a lot of good singing. But when we get up to heaven, we will all be on perfect pitch. You men that sound like a frog sometimes, I'm telling you, you're going to sound like, you're going to sound like Phil. Man, I can't wait. I can't wait to just, I, the first time you sing, Phil, you, you, your old skinny self come up here and I just thought, what is going to happen? And I'm telling you, when he opened his mouth, my mouth dropped. Still, my favorite song that you've ever sang is I bowed on my knees and cried holy. We will do that in heaven, folks. I'm telling you, uh, it's, and again, if there's no tears in heaven, I understand that. But I'm telling you, we will be beyond joy. Beyond joy. We have some happy times here on earth. But I'm telling you, the first 60 seconds in heaven is going to blow you away. You said, I mean, the Bible says, I have not heard, and I have not seen, ear hath not heard. You can't fathom what it's going to be like. So praise breaks out in heaven. And they say, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. And again, sometimes, folks, I understand Satan is mighty. I understand he has a lot of power. He has a lot of influence. But God is almighty. It literally means almighty means ruler of all. Folks, there's a chain. There's a leadership chain. There's a food chain. However you want. And I'm telling you, God is at the top of the chain. He is ruler. He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. And it says, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And again, folks, this is, talks about him being eternal. This is the third time in Revelation we see this phrase. So, there was no beginning. God always was. Jesus always was. He is today. He's still reigning. Seems like these leaders and these foreign leaders and these powerful dictators are running the world. But I got news for even little rocket man. I got news for him. All right? He is going to bow before God and, and, and he is going to recognize God as who he is and he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Because you have taken your great power and reigned. Oh, if you think about the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, folks, it was a perfect place. But man messed it up. Sin entered the world, and we have been fighting with sin ever since. What was rightfully God, what has always been God, has been basically destroyed. But God is going to make all things right. Oh, folks, I cannot wait for that day. Jesus will rule from Jerusalem, the city of David. So we see praise for God's power. But not only praise for God's power, but praise for God's judgment. There are people who say, well, why were you happy about judgment? Well, folks, I got news for you. All of us are going to be judged. Every one of us is going to stand before God. But still, he is saying in verse 18, the nations were angry, and your wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Basically, there will be two judgment seats. The Bema seat is for the Christian. And folks, I want to, you to understand, your sins were judged at the cross. Your sins were paid for at the cross. I had and heard an evangelist said, and, and I was a young youth minister, and I had to sit there and chew on this a while, and he said, every sin you ever committed in your life is going to be shown on a big screen. And I thought, I'm going to be there a while. Folks, your sin is forgiven. And what he will judge is your works, what you have done since you've been saved according to the Word of God. And I will show you that in just 
a few minutes. But I'm telling you, those who have not received Jesus as Lord, they are going to the great white throne judgment. And folks, they will be judged by the book, by their works. And because they have not invited Jesus Christ into their life, it will be a harsh judgment. I've heard all kinds of answers to someone who doesn't want to get saved after I've presented the gospel. I had one guy say that, you know, when I hear that trumpet, I'm going to just start praying the sinner's prayer there. Well, you might ought to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, I read a commentary one time that says that that is one, one one thousandth percent of a second. You're not going to get it out in that time, folks. You make your decision now. And the Bible even says this. Look in Revelation chapter 20. Go back to Revelation 20 and look at verse, look at verse 11. Then I saw the great white throne, that's the judgment, and him who sat on it, from whose face, uh, face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was uh, found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, all right, plural, books. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the the books. Folks, God misses nothing. God knows everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, God knows. And it says, and the sea gave up the dead uh, who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Folks, it does not do my heart good to say what I'm fixing to say, but it is the truth of the matter. If you die without Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, you will spend an eternity in hell. And you know what some people, you know how they play it off? Well, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in that Bible of yours. Oh, folks, I believe there's a heaven, and I believe there's a hell because the Word of God teaches it. And it is going to be the worst day of their lives. Those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Folks, He's recording his books are perfect. There is nothing, nothing changes. It is written, you know, and, and when you get saved, the opposite is also true, folks. Your name is written in the book of life. And you will live. You will be with Him forever and forever. So we see the judgment, and it sounds harsh, but folks, God is fair. God gives everyone a chance to be saved. The gospel of Christ, I mean, how could you not hear the gospel with the way things are now with television and computers and online? It's everywhere. The gospel is everywhere. And those who reject the, the gospel, I'm telling you, you will regret it for the rest of your life. And the rest of that verse says, and, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And again, he throws that last sentence in. We're not talking about someone who does not take care of the environment. Folks, I believe we need to take care of the environment. I really do. Uh, I, I believe we need to take care of our world. This is our world. God has given us our world, and we need to respect that. But that's not what God is talking about. It's talking about those who promote sin, those who don't live by the rules, those 
who even sometimes shake their fist in the face of God. He will destroy them. That is the bad news. But you know what else? There's good news. The good news is that as Christians, we will receive rewards. Oh, folks, I've competed in athletics all pretty much all my life. And I remember when I played softball after I quit playing baseball, I played for a team out of Lawton. In a, there were five of us from Lawton and five, of, five other guys from Weatherford, Oklahoma. And we'd go to tournaments, a slow-pitch softball, and I cannot tell you, uh, I had a box, a huge box, it's just full of those trophies. First place, second place. Those two, many, many times. And do you know what happened to those trophies? I have no idea. <laughs> Last time I saw them, they were in my parents' attic. And when we moved, I guess we forgot them. But do you realize that those trophies mean nothing spiritually? I'm not saying you shouldn't play slow-pitch softball, but as a Christian, you know what you should pray, play for? Number one, you should play for God and be a witness to Him. Number two, you ought to be trying to win people to Christ on your baseball team, on your volleyball team, in your choir. That's where the rewards are. And 1 Corinthians 3 says this. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 3. The Apostle Paul says it very plain here. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than what that which is laid is Jesus Christ. Folks, when you get, when you get saved, everything changes. See, we live for ourselves. We love that trophy. We love to stand on the field and be number one and we'd stand on some, sometimes they'd have a podium out there and we'd all get on that. And we'd all say, have you noticed even bad teams say they're number one? I'm like, what is that? But it truly means nothing, folks. The greatest day of my life was August 23rd, 1980, when Jesus Christ came into my life and changed me. That was the greatest day. Now look at verse 2, 12. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, those things that you do for Christ are gold, silver, and precious stones. Why? Because they won't, they won't burn up. They just get purified. And it says wood, hay, straw, is the second kind of work. And folks, these are things that you have done for yourself or for the applause of man or to make maybe someone else look good or to guilt someone into doing something else. And it's not wrong to do good things, but the work of the Lord is the most important work in your life. Verse 13, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it. Notice the day. That's what we are talking about. We're still in the day of the Lord because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work. When that fire hits that wood straw and hey, I'm telling you, it'll be burned up. It'll mean nothing to you. And matter of fact, that's exactly what God did in my life when I was 19 years old and playing baseball for Cameron University. He allowed me to hit a ball off the center field fence. When I was going around second base, the base slid out from under me. I was on full scholarship as a college player, and it broke my ankle, tore my tendons, tore my ligaments. And Dr. Wilson, I can still remember in the emergency room saying, you probably won't play any competitive sports again. And do you know what? As I look back on life, that was probably the, best thing that happened to me because all I wanted to do and y'all are going to make fun of me for this but I just wanted to play baseball for the Cincinnati Reds why Joe Morgan Johnny Bench you around my age know who I'm talking about the big red machine and God said no 
No. I'm going to make a preacher out of you. What? <laughs> if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet though through the fire. Oh, I believe with all my heart, and you don't have time to write these down, and so I'll leave these in the office if you, want to, if you want to call and get these. But from what I have read and studied, there are five crowns that a Christian can get. Number one is the incorruptible crown, and that's for faithfulness. It's found in 1 Corinthians 9.25. The second crown is the crown of rejoicing for all of the soul winners. If you are a soul winner, Psalm 126.6. The third one is the crown of righteousness for those who love his appearing, 2 Timothy 4.8. The fourth crown is the crown of glory for faithful pastors, 1 Peter 5.2-4. The fifth crown is the crown of life for those who are martyred, Revelation 2.10. But you know what we're going to do with those crowns according to Revelation? We are going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. We're not piling it up in front of us and say, hey, look what we've done. Folks, we've done nothing. It is God who saves. It is God who works. This is God's church. God is everything to a Christian. But we'll be able to lay those crowns at Jesus' feet. The last thing. The last thing I want you to see, not only praise for God's power, not only praise for God's judgment, but praise for God, praise for God's covenant. Look at that last verse, verse 19. That it, then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightning and noises and thundering and an earthquake and great hail. Notice the temple of God. Folks, he's talking about in heaven. That final place uh, that we will be with God. And we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. We know uh, in the Old Testament days, there were five different kinds of arks in the Old Testament. One is the Ark of His Covenant, which here is in Revelation eleven nineteen. Two is the Ark of the Testimony, which is in Exodus 25, 22. Three is the Ark of God, which is in 1 Samuel 3, verse 3. Four is the Holy Ark in 2 Chronicles 35, 3. And five is the Ark of God's strength in Psalm 132, 8. And you have to remember, and you have to go back to that first temple. There was the first place, the holy place. And then that second uh, you know, where the veil is cut in two was the Holy of Holies. And that was the place where God dwelt. In that ark was, was the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments was there with the, the presence of God. And now you have to realize we are no longer under that. All right? There is no blood sacrifices anymore, even though some in third world countries are doing that. Jesus' blood paid for our sins. It paid for our sins. And the other thing he's showing us by opening heaven up is we have direct access to God. Any minute, any time, any day, I can talk to God. Any time I want to pray to God. Any time I want to invite his presence into my life, I can and I don't need to confess my sin to another sinner. I don't need to confess my sin to a man. I need to confess my sin to God. Matter of fact, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Look at this scripture. We're almost done. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus... Folks, that's why the veil of the temple was torn in two. He's saying, we're not going to do this anymore. My, this is my body. This is the New Testament. And by the new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Hey, I got a high priest. 
It is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. Hebrews says that over and over again. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He even takes those things that were in the temple and says that we can apply them today. Okay? We need a clean heart. We need a clean mind. We need a clean body. And it says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, heaven is for all born-again believers. Heaven is God and Jesus' permanent dwelling place. The Ark of the Covenant is there, and we can see it plain and simple. It is a place of communion with God. The mercy seat, God has taken care of. But the thing more than anything is we are in the divine presence of God. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And I close with this. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. And we know, folks, that is coming. I am telling you, this deal with Israel, it is a sign that our redemption draweth nigh. It is just as the book of Revelation has said. It is just as the prophetic scriptures that we have read in this studies is saying. Also, there was no more sea than I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And folks, here is my opinion, okay? We will go through the bold judgments. We will go through the battle of Armageddon, and we will watch God and Jesus do their thing. And they will destroy the earth as we know it. And it will usher in the new millennial kingdom. The new kingdom. And what will happen is that very kingdom will be transformed. Look what it says. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God. That perfect place up here will be that perfect place down here. And we will study the dimensions. We will study heaven when we come to it. But it's all brand new prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. There will be no competition in heaven, folks. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. It is done. Oh, excuse me. And he said to me, Write these words, because they are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the fountain of water of life freely to him that thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Folks, you want peace today? Man, there is no peace in this world. None. You want peace today? Give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Oh, folks, there's only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of the world and there's the kingdom of God. There's only two choices on where you spend an eternity. You will spend it with God if you are truly saved. And if you're not, you will spend 
in eternity in hell. And the best news I have and I can say is we in this service now is that you can be saved today. If you'll confess your sins, if you'll repent of your sins, if you'll recognize Jesus for who He is and God for who He is, if you will make Jesus and God Lord of your life, you can spend an eternity in heaven. But God's not going to make you be saved. He's not going to make you do it. You just heard the gospel. So the decision is totally up to you. Father, thank you for revelation. Thank you for our study. And God, I know in some ways it just sounds harsh, but it really is not. God's given everyone in this building a second chance. God's given everyone in this building a chance to trust you alone for your salvation. God, your grace is here. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God sent his son to die for everyone in this room. But God, we have to do it your way. And God, I pray, if there's one here today that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that they could find that peace that passes all understanding. I pray that they could find that joy of the Lord, and it can be their strength. God, I pray that they totally surrender all to you this day. I don't, it, it really doesn't matter if they've come to this church for a while. It doesn't really matter even if they've already been baptized. If they don't really know you, they just got wet. And God, I pray that today they would get right with you. God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray everything we do and we say would point people towards Jesus. God, the time is near. It's near. And if we're going to do anything for you, I think today would be a good day. So God, this is your invitation. These are your people. You work. You work your Holy Spirit through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?